Hello, I'm Jan Newharth, Chair and Chief Executive Officer of the Freedom Forum. Welcome to the final day of the Free Expression Festival, a series of programs leading up to tonight's Free Expression Awards, an annual event where the Freedom Forum recognizes individuals for their courageous acts of free and fearless expression. The festival features honorees, presenters, and guest speakers talking about the importance of the First Amendment in their work. Today, we feature Wall Street Journal columnist, William McGurn, who talks about the life and work of Jimmy Lai, former chairman and founder of Apple Daily and Next Digital, and a Hong Kong pro-democracy activist. Jimmy is a 2021 Free Expression Award honoree. This program is brought to you by the Freedom Forum, which fosters First Amendment freedoms for all. Our vision is an America where everyone knows, understands, values, and defends the freedoms of religion, speech, press, assembly, and petition. And now, please welcome our moderator, Melanie Kirkpatrick, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and a former deputy editor of the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Hello, and welcome to the Freedom Forum's Free Expression Festival. I'm Melanie Kirkpatrick, a senior fellow at the Hudson Institute and a former deputy editor of the Wall Street Journal editorial page. Today, I'm pleased to lead a discussion about Jimmy Lai, the former chairman and founder of Apple Daily and Next Digital, and a Hong Kong pro-democracy leader. The Freedom Forum is honoring Jimmy with its 2021 Free Expression Award, which recognizes individuals for their courageous acts of freedom. I am joined by William McGurn, a longtime member of the Wall Street Editorial Board, who writes the weekly, terrifically wonderful Main Street column, which appears in the journal every Tuesday. Previously, Bill served as chief speechwriter for President George W. Bush. And before that, Bill spent a number of years in Hong Kong in the 80s and the 90s, working for the Wall Street Journal. He's the author of a prescient book on Hong Kong, whose title says it all, Providius Albion, The Abandonment of Hong Kong. Bill is a close and longtime friend of Jimmy Lai, and he also knows Hong Kong very, very well. Welcome, Bill. Thanks, Melanie. Good to be here. Let, let me begin with the obvious question. Why are you here? Where is Jimmy? <laughs> I'm here because uh, Jimmy lies in jail, but let, let me first give people a little background. I've known Melanie almost uh, 40 years, and it started with Hong Kong. She was in Hong Kong doing features for the Asian Wall Street Journal, and I was in Brussels doing features for the European Wall Street Journal. And at one point, I, I took Melanie's job. I can't say I took Melanie's place. No one could do that <laughs> in Hong Kong in the mid-'80s. And we've always had a very intimate relationship because when I went there, I bought her oven and stove. In Hong Kong, <laughs> appliances are incredibly expensive. So I bought her oven and stove. Apartments don't come with anything, not even a light bulb. And then I sold it when I left. And then I came back five years later, and I bought it again from someone else. So I don't know where it is now, but Melanie and I have uh, known each other uh, since then, and there's no one that knows Hong Kong better. Y you asked about Jimmy Lai. I mean, I met Jimmy Lai uh, in Hong Kong, and he was, uh, at the time, he was most famous for a clothing chain called Giordano's. And Giordano's was kind of like a gap over here, but Hong Kong didn't really have any kind of middle class stores or anything. It had, you could buy designer stuff on the street or really, really cheap stuff, but it didn't have these stores catering to the middle class with good quality um, and low prices. And so he did that and I got to meet him. Um, we did an article on his clothing chain, how revolutionary it was. It was all bright colors like polo shirts and so forth. And then he had a, went on to found a, a, a magazine and a newspaper that became, you know, among the most popular papers, Apple Daily and uh, Next Media. And in all that time, one reason people like Melanie and I got to be his friends uh, so much in the Wall Street Journal, some of our other colleagues, is that we were very sympathetic on ideas of liberty. Jimmy had um, 
had become a real fan of Friedrich Hayek. Um, and so was I. And so we, we kind of bonded over that. And it was interesting because Hayek's diagnoses, um, he never talked about uh, China in it, but a lot of Chinese that read it understand immediately what he's talking about. So Jimmy has always been a voice for freedom, for democracy in, in Hong Kong, uh, for could, its could, free economy. And, and as you know, he had very little formal education. I'm pretty sure he didn't finish high school, but he, you know, he's fr- he was, was friends with Milton Friedman, took Friedman into China for one of his early visits with uh, Bob Mundell, with other economists and so forth. So really quite an extraordinary person and an entrepreneur over several different industries, you know, from clothing and the news business. And he tried an internet business at one point, all sorts of things. And, and Bill, Bill, could I interrupt here to say, um, I, I just wanted to agree with you about your assessment of um, Jimmy. He is, um, I, as you say, he had very little formal education, but yet he is one of the most intellectual people I've ever met. Right. He has a, a very strong, a very deep life of the mind. And uh, his, for me, his ideas about freedom formed uh, perhaps initially with the idea of economic freedom, right. uh, such as uh, you know, Hayek and Mundell and Milton Friedman and other economists um, uh, were drawn to him and he to them, uh, and then expanded to other forms of freedom as well. Yeah, I agree entirely. He, uh, you know, I first found out about Hayek. So uh, I was at the Far Eastern Economic Review, also owned by Dow Jones, also based in Hong Kong. And we did that story about Giordano because it was very revolutionary, appealing to the new middle class and so forth with good prices and um, good quality. And after we ran that, uh, my boss, Gordon Krovitz, another friend of yours, Melanie, from the Wall Street Journal, sent me a note. And he has very spidery handwriting, so I couldn't always figure it out. And the note said, as far as I read it, Jimmy claims to be the man, uh, the only man in Hong Kong to have read all of um, Engel. And I looked at that and I thought, okay, it's an achievement, but it's kind of like in China, you see these kind of achievements, like you see someone's written the Iliad on a fingernail, you know, um, in Chinese. And you say, well, it's an achievement, but what does it do? Well, I had misread it. It wasn't Engels, it was it was Hayek. And it really made him fascinating because Jimmy, I think, uh, as you hinted at, he, he would not be one of these people that separates economic and, um, and political freedom. I mean, I think his view is rooted in his view of the human person and the dignity and so forth. So he's been a champion of both. And in fact, he sees encroachments on economic freedom as a way to curtail people's, you know, other freedoms. If you don't own property, for example, you can't have a free press, right? Um, the yeah. press is hot yeah. to the government. So uh, it's it's been a real discovery. As you know, what Jimmy liked to do was have journalists and intellectuals over to his house for dinner. And they were just some of the most fascinating dinners that, that I had ever no, and my family in particular became very entwined in his family. So I should also confess for full disclosure, I'm also Jimmy's godfather. Um, he converted to Christianity right before 1997, uh, largely through his wife. And uh, and so we have that relationship and we're just, we're very close. And I, I what I see that unifies Jimmy is that he has a very sound, simple, but comprehensive view of the human person and the threats to the human person, especially from um, a, a government that doesn't yield any rights, that all your rights are are grants of the state rather than, you know, as we express it, you know, an unalienated right that's um, um, God-given. Backing up to um, Jimmy's arrival in Hong Kong, could you say a few words about uh his life in China and uh, what motivated him to uh, Hong Kong. Well, that's what makes him so interesting. I mean, he's a billionaire now, but my understanding is he arrived in Hong Kong sometime in his teens uh, when he was a kid looking for opportunity. And there, I've heard various versions and maybe various parts of the trip where he snuck in 
on the bottom of a boat or something. But when he got there, he lived there. For, he he worked lived on the streets for a few years. You know, he really came from nothing, just this ragged kid from China and hustled and worked hard. At some point, he went to the United States and he worked in the garment district in Manhattan, you know, where you're pulling, pushing the racks of clothes and so forth. And he was living with a um, Jewish salesman who is the man who introduced him to Hayek, gave him a book, said, you should read this, probably um, The Road to Serfdom or something. And he just gobbled it up and he's been been uh, like that ever since. Yeah, it's it's a wonderful story. One variation I've heard is that he was working in the Guangzhou, then the Canton, uh, train station, and uh, he uh, as a porter, and he saw people who uh, came from Hong Kong, talked to them, and heard about life in Hong Kong, and decided that he could have a better life if he could only get to Hong Kong. Oh, well, yeah, that I. I think that's largely true. I don't know exactly the reasons he left. He's given sort of vague, it's kind of vague, you know, how Chinese are with dates and, you know, when they were born and all this stuff. So um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I have two different years for his birth. It's hard for me to kind of um, make up. And I'm not sure he had a birth certificate. So, um, you know, it's very arbitrary. But yeah, he did He did come over for that. And, um, and I think he said he sensed, as, as I know you know and have sensed, there is the smell of opportunity in Hong Kong. There's just energy. And people don't remember today because Hong Kong, uh, China's opened up its economy. But in those days, if you went to China, it was very sleepy. I mean, apart from years like the Cultural Revolution, where there were these huge upheavals, it was just sleepy. The, like, like a lot of communist societies, the city life was just dead and the economic life was minimal and so forth. And and now China's very dynamic. But then when when you're a kid from uh from China and you land in Hong Kong, there's choice, there's variety, there's lights, there's a lot going on. And he just, you know, he he was just very always very at home in Hong Kong. Yeah. And he would have come at a time when Hong Kong was changing rapidly. Uh, one of the right. things I remember about visiting China in uh, around 1980 is how dark it was in the cities right. and uh, it, it just uh, the the lack of dyna dynamism that you uh, uh, described was absolutely true. Let's, uh, Bill, though, can we return to my first question um, uh, about where Jimmy is right now? He's, he's in jail. And could you just give us a kind of a, a sequence of events that uh, led up to his uh, being arrested? So mostly this, I mean, the Chinese authorities have never liked Jimmy. And one reason his the main reason is his publications, Apple and Next, because they really reported on the Chinese and Hong Kong governments and in a highly critical way often. So they trust Next and Apple in a way they don't trust a lot of the other things going on. So from the time you were there, even before you, um, you know, China has been trying to walk back the, um, the 1984 Joint Declaration, right? The, the, the basic promise of that is Hong Kong will give you democracy, but we get you, Hong Kong. And since the agreement was signed, China has steadily been walking it back, mostly by fooling around with the election system, like limiting who can run, making sure that those elected directly by the people don't really have power, all sorts of things. That's exploded in the last two years where they're kind of expelling people from the legislative council by making them take an oath they can't take, all sorts of tricks. And uh, Jimmy's been calling them out loudly and um, clearly. He's very clear about his values and so forth. And people, people have to understand the other thing about Jimmy Lai is um, he may be a billionaire, but he's a fighter. And he, you know, he came over, as I say, as a street kid, he's a fighter. When I lived in Hong Kong in the nineties, right before it went back to China, um, armed robbers had a home invasion at his house and they were armed. And one of them tried to take his wife's wedding ring in his house where he's outnumbered where by guys with guns and Jimmy fought him. He just physically fought him. He got conked over the head with the gun button and everything, 
but they didn't get his wife's wedding ring. That's that's who he is. His instinct is to fight. And because of that, his also sense of integrity, he's in jail. He could have gone anywhere. He has a home in, in Japan. He has one in Taiwan, uh, a, an apartment in Paris. He's a billionaire. He could have left Hong Kong anytime and not been subject to these arrests. But he watched other people get arrested, like Jonathan Wong and Agnes Chow and so forth. And he just said, I'm not going to run. And he, 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 this guy chose a jail cell. Uh, you know, right behind me over here, I have a picture of um, Jimmy being let off in handcuffs uh, when he was arrested. And it was, it's a photo that was designed to humiliate him by uh, having him in manacles and a, and a handcuff. But, you know, most Hong Kong people see it as a badge of honor. This man's willing to pay the price. Not everyone has that choice. You know, a lot of people sit at home waiting for the police to come crashing through the doors and arrest you. Jimmy could have run, and this billionaire chose, you know, the dissident's life of a jail cell. And that's why he's there. Um, he could have run away very easily, but he didn't. And that's that just speaks to the man that he is. And I need to I'd like to say something about his wife, too, because his wife, Teresa, is a very strong and devout woman. She is biased. She wouldn't leave either. People say you should go because she has an official role on the board, I believe, of uh, Apple Daily. And uh, she won't she won't leave her husband. Um, she's by his side. And she's also given him to her person. You know, her strength is more endurance. You know, it's not Jimmy's strength is to fight. Punch me, I'm going to throw a punch back. Her strength is endurance and just sticking to your principles and, and a great love. And that uh, you know, I that would I would say has really affected Jimmy in jail because his nature again to fight. I think without his wife, someone told me he'd be like a caged beast in man manacles, railing and fighting and living on anger and hate. And that's not how he is at all. In jail, he's accepting his cross. He's accepting the what's coming to make his witness. And he's trying to maintain his decency in doing that. He's remarkably at peace. I would say almost more at peace than when he was outside. It's just an extraordinary thing to watch this man go from the comforts of a billionaire to a jail cell to someone who's who's kind of at peace with it. He's willing to go, uh, to go and do it and use jail as just another front in his battle to show what we believe and uh, you know why it's good. I'd add one other thing about uh, uh, Jimmy in this context, Bill, which is that uh, unlike every other mogul in uh, Hong Kong, uh, he is not outsourcing his uh, ideas or his uh, principles. Uh, you know, the others are staying or they have cowed to China. And uh, Billy won't do that. And that, of course, is the reason that uh, Beijing uh, hates him with a ferocity that it uh, uh, doesn't uh, reserve for anybody else. Yeah. I mean, that, that has always been the primary distinction. I think that's the reason he got along with, um, with us at the Wall Street Journal. Uh, you know, uh, Melanie and I know from living there, you know, most of the, um, the big moguls, the rich people, um, like in a lot of places, kind of suck up to the government and so forth. Never try not to be political, toe the line. That was easier under the British because the British didn't make as many political demands. Now we're seeing, we're kind of seeing the truth of Jimmy's refusal to divide economic freedom from political freedom. The pressure on businesses in Hong Kong right now from China is just extraordinary. Most of them won't say anything. And Melanie, when you were there, I know, like with me, the ones who are afraid, they'd whisper to you. They would never be quoted on it. You know, China was doing something bad for Hong Kong. They wouldn't be quoted on it, but they would whisper their concerns. But some of the ones that have been become public, when the demonstrations first broke out in Hong Kong, the mass demonstrations um, in 2019, uh, I know China pressured Cathay Pacific Airlines to turn over lists of any workers who might have demonstrated against China. Um, 
the the, the former chief executive, uh, you know, the the Chinese word for um, governor in the new system, uh, once called for a boycott of Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, which is based in London, but called for a boycott because they hadn't endorsed a national security law. These are all things businesses never had to do before, and they're being squeezed and they're feeling it. And again, one of the few people to stand up to it is Jimmy Lai and, and his paper, Apple Daily. Um, Apple Daily and uh, Next Media expanded to Taiwan uh, some right. years ago. Could you, uh, that, that was another uh, uh, step that um, uh, Jimmy took that enraged China. Could you talk a little bit about uh, their role in, uh, uh, the role of the press in Taiwan, of Apple Daily and, and Next Media? Yeah, I think it's very important because it's, it's a, you know, it's rooted in Hong Kong. My, my understanding is, is the separate entity, you know, they're both owned by Jimmy. I'm not as, as, as sure of the corporate arrangements and so forth, but it shares the same values and it brings it to Taiwan. And, you know, though Taiwan, Taiwan has made many strides toward freedom, it hadn't really become as, you know, as free as, um, Hong Kong was. So it's, I think it's an important voice there. I think as the broader principle that you hit on is even more important. I think as Hong Kong goes, you know, becomes, I mean, the, the fear of Hong Kong is always that it would just be a, another Chinese city, right? Nothing to distinguish itself rather than what you and I remember it as is this great beacon of light to Chinese people. This is what Chinese people can accomplish if they're free, if they're just given the freedom. And now Taiwan's moving there. And with Hong Kong, the pressure on Hong Kong, I think our hopes for, you know, a free Chinese society really are moving to um, to Taiwan. So we have to do things, you know, to keep it um, keep it together and protect it, I think, against China's um, China's onslaught. There's a lot of trade, for example, between Hong Kong and Taiwan. And um, China's going to use it to squeeze them, to put pressure on them. They're already doing that. So uh, we need more of these institutions there and they become more important. Yeah, absolutely. And the role of the press in um, a free society is crucial, as uh, we who have spent our lives, professional lives as journalists, know. Uh, and working in Asia, you learn this very quickly. Right. Um, when um, I was there in the 80s and then uh, for a, a little while in the 90s too, Hong Kong had the freest press in the region. Uh, Singapore had a very controlled press. Um, and in the 80s, Taiwan and, um, and uh, South Korea were, were not very free. They were just beginning to open up. So um, all the uh, foreign correspondents were stationed in Hong Kong, and that was a way to keep an eye on China as well. And you had a, a sense of the vibrancy, um, and not just of the city and and the economy, but also of the press. It was, uh, uh, you know, it was sometimes a little wild and woolly, but uh, it was um, it was a powerful um, uh, and essential component to uh, Hong Kong's um, ability to thrive. Yeah, I think that's especially important today. Um, you know, when when we, we recently did an editorial at the journal and, um, you know, my boss, your former boss, Paul go, who was with you in Asia, uh, was talking about this. And um, the, the key to a free press is an independent press. And one reason that uh, when you were you and I were overseas with the Asian Wall Street Journal, it had so much credibility is that we had the resources and the strength to resist the government. So people trusted what, what they got in our paper and a lot of the foreign press as more accurate than their local papers that were more subjected to uh, controls. And, uh, you know, recently we did an editorial on Hong Kong and this idea of freedom. And Paul, you know, Paul wrote, um, how can you have economic freedom, you know, the freedom to invest and so forth? If you don't have a free press, for example, free to investigate corruption, do you really want to invest in a country where there's no reporting on what companies do, no accountability except behind doors? So it's, it's very, very important. As you know, just part of that indication was that 
This year, the Heritage Foundation puts out an annual index of uh, economic freedom, I believe. And this year, it took Hong Kong off the, the index. It used to, for, the, for 25 of the last 27 years, it's been number one on this list. Um, and the argument is just that the distinctions between China and Hong Kong are just eroding. Uh, and one of those is surely freedom of the press. You know, are people going to be prosecuted? You know, when you have China kidnapping like booksellers for selling books critical of China and they, they suddenly appear in China, you know, from Thailand or something, that's a big concern. So all these, all these things I think are coming together and, um, you know, what, what these countries really need is not just a Wall Street Journal or something. They need the local press being able to press these issues and cover them. In Hong Kong, they used to have it. Um, and I think it's increasingly being eroded. Oh, well, Bill, let me uh, ask you one final question, if I may, um, about the future. Could you uh, give us your view of where you think Hong Kong is going? Uh, do you see any optimism? And um, what do you think is uh, going to happen uh, with uh, Jimmy Lai? Okay, well, let me let me answer them um, simply. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen to Jimmy. I just ask people to look. He faces a lot of um, charges. They're going to do the count separately, like involving demonstrations. The the main one is this August 2019 demonstration that the police declared illegal. So if you went there, you were charged uh, with uh, illegal assembly. And a lot of people have been arrested on that. And Jimmy's charged with several counts that I think he's also charged with organizing it. And there are going to be trials over the next like two or three months on these charges. After that, he also faces a charge under the new national security law that China pushed through Hong Kong. The importance of this law is that the penalties, not only are the penalties more severe, Jimmy's charged under this with collusion with foreigners, partly for writing for foreign papers, or he's gone to the US and he's met with, you know, Nancy Pelosi and uh, say Mike Pence and so forth. Um, but that the importance of that national security law is it's, it, it acts as a trump card. It basically overrides all the other laws and allows China to kind of do what it wants, including bring certain people to China for trial and I presume incarceration. So that's a real that's a real problem. It's already overridden the uh, the normal bail practices under common law, which is the law that operates in Hong Kong. And it's why Jimmy's in jail and not out on bail, which he's really entitled to under the regular law. So what happens to Jimmy? I don't know. A lot of it depends. I think he'll rack up a few sentences over these smaller things. And then uh, they'll get him on the national security charge. And the question is, you know, how much time they'll give him. They're serious because Jimmy, Jimmy's a big guy. So the message is if you go after Jimmy Lai, and he's not the only one they're going after. There are thousands of people that face charges. But the message is if they can get Jimmy Lai, a billionaire, they can surely get me. Um, so it's very important to China to punish Jimmy. And I think hopefully put Next and um, Apple out of business. So uh, that's, I think that's the big question mark, you know, and then I think it would be up uh, once he's sentenced, I think it'd be up to people in the U.S. and so forth to, um, to put pressure to get him out. But I think, I, sadly, it looks like it's going to take a lot of time before we can do that. And uh, now Jimmy does have a British passport, so presumably the British will be involved in trying to seek his release. I mean, the point is that what he's charged with wouldn't be crimes in the U.S. or most other, you know, places really rooted in a rule of law. So it's or would very, they have, very, nor would they have been, nor would they have been crimes in Hong Kong not very long right, ago. Exactly before. I mean, the British colonial mm -hmm. governments tolerated an awful lot that um, um, the Chinese government just won't tolerate. On Hong Kong, I'm pretty pessimistic because I think it's it's really hard to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. You know, a system of free enterprise, minimal government involvement and so forth, freedom. That That's not just what laws you have, 
but that's how you've exercised them over the years. There's a lot of tradition in there. That's what gives people confidence. They look at a place as honored contracts and so forth for years. Once you mess with that, um, it's, it's a very hard reputation to overcome. And that's what I fear. Hong Kong is still freer economically than uh, China is, right? But it just seems to be eroding in the distinctive difference. The US, for example, no longer treats Hong Kong um, any different from China when it comes to its tariffs and stuff because of these actions. And that's the real tragedy. You know, it's funny, you ask about the future. In um, 1992 or something, in the early 90s, when I was living in Hong Kong, I wrote a book about about it called Perfidious Albion. Then the villain was Britain for denying Hong Kong democracy and stuff. They kind of this was before Chris Patton, so they kind of changed their their mind on that and tried to democratize the place before they left. But I was very pessimistic even then. And as you know, the Wall Street, the Asian Wall Street Journal, we were more pessimistic about the communists than most of the people around us. Most of the people around us are, don't worry, China's not going to strangle the goose that lays the golden egg. Um, you see right now they've got all guns trained on the, on the goose. They're very good at strangling uh, geese that lay golden eggs. So I'm, I'm very worried. I, I'm, what I'm really worried about is that nothing will improve in Hong Kong until something happens in China. Um, but as pessimistic as I was when I wrote this book 30 years ago or so, I could not have imagined what we're seeing today. Um, the resistance on the streets, the fights, the willingness of China to reduce this place to rubble um, rather than make accommodation with the people. I, and, and frankly, the political engagement in the 80s when people like protested for democracy, the, the leaders were lucky to get a dozen people there. You probably never saw more than uh, one or two dozen uh, in your time there. That was that changed after after 1997 in Tiananmen Square. But it's a much more politicized place. I think a lot more people are looking for backdoor options like let's send our kids to Australia or Canada or the US. Uh, and it's sad because I do think Hong Kong's on the way to becoming just an, another Chinese city, which was always the real tragedy. But I never expected the violent clashes or anything. And to see a police force that I had previously associated with confidence, professionalism, um, and, and ability and, a, and, a, and, and politeness um, assault, you know, Hong Kong civilians the way I, I have seen in the last few years. I, I never expected, I never expected to be so public um, and so crude when it came. I thought there might be a gradual erosion and so forth, but I didn't expect armed police clashing and sometimes with armed protesters. Well, thank you, Bill. Uh, on that sad note, um, I want to say how important and interesting your insights into Hong Kong and into the, um, the life and the beliefs of the courageous man that uh, the Freedom Ex Expression Festival is honoring. So thank you, Bill. And I, I would like to close um, with uh, the words of Jimmy Lai. I thought it would be appropriate to hear something that he said in his own words that uh, exemplifies some of the things that Bill is, and I have been talking about. And here, here, here he said, here is what he said in November, not long before he was arrested um, the following month. My life is about something more than myself, he said. Once I started to fight for freedom, my life changed. I feel, I feel there is a purpose and meaning in my life. Even if I have to go to jail, which is very likely, I don't regret it. I consider it a redemption of the life that I have had. I am prepared for anything. Thank you all for watching. I'm Melanie Kirkpatrick. Thank you for joining us today. This concludes the Free Expression Festival, and we hope you will join us tonight at 7 p.m. for our fifth annual Free Expression Awards. To sign up, visit freeexpressionawards.org. And you can catch up on all the Free Expression Festival programs by visiting our YouTube channel.